Well, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, fantastic. My name is Kathleen, and when Roberta first asked me to speak here, with it being Black History Month and Valentine's Day coming up, uh, that nice little intersection tends to be interracial relationships. And so she asked me to come speak uh, sort of on behalf of that. My wonderful husband, who is listed in there, is in his final semester of grad school, so he's just hanging out back there. Um, but do know that he was in the shaping of this that we're going to be sharing today. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the history of interracial relationships here in the good old US of A, but it wasn't very favorable for a really long time. And it wasn't until uh, just a little over 51 years ago that there were two individuals, uh, Mildred Jeter and Richard Loving. Uh, Mildred Jeter was a black woman and Richard Loving was a white man, and they had wanted to become married. And they lived in the good old state of Virginia, which did not think that was a good idea. So, when I say not a good idea, I mean they were both arrested and spent time in jail for their desire to marry each other. Fortunately, they were able to take their case all the way to the Supreme Court, and it was at the Supreme Court ruling back in June 12, 1967, that there was finally a ruling at a national level that allowed for interracial marriage. So when we were planning our wedding and we knew some big life events we wanted to have happen before it and after it and all those things, um, and we found out that the 50th anniversary was smack dab in the middle, we figured it was destined. So that's why we got married on a Monday, not a very popular choice. <laughs> but that being said, when we look at the history of interracial couples, there was a lot of explicit bias. It was very clearly stated how people felt about individuals with different races marrying each other. Um, it wasn't favorable. There were individuals and couples that were attacked violently uh, for being interracial couples. And even within the legal case, if you think about the fact that the state of Virginia was willing to stand there in a court, in the Supreme Court, and state unequivocally that individuals should not be allowed to marry unless they were of the same race, that's a pretty powerful, very explicit statement. Now when we look at how that has rolled out through the last 51 and a half years, um, it's similar to people's views societally on race as a whole. Uh, there are certainly pockets of explicit racism that still exist, but much of it is now viewed through the lens of implicit bias. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with implicit bias. This may be kind of a recap if you're familiar, but implicit bias is this fascinating thing that the brain does to give us subconscious views that shape our immediate decision making. So back when there were saber-toothed tiger, tigers roaming around, this was a very helpful device in the brain. Because if you saw your buddy get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, it was good for there to be a little mental note of, oh, maybe stay away from the saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> this was an excellent defense mechanism. Unfortunately, our brains sometimes do this. Well, everybody's brain does this. And unfortunately, we get signals that are not the most accurate into our brain. So I'm going to delve a little into some, hopefully not overly political things, as I don't want to start a huge discussion at this point, but... It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's always fun, that's good. Um, so when we look, for example, at how individuals are portrayed in movies and in TV, in the media, in different places like that, um, it is not always a very accurate representation. Now we know, um, if you look at a fair amount of sociological data, that the most violent crimes within the United States, including mass murderers, tend to be committed by what group of folks? White. white. White men. But when we see the news and we see that a white man has just killed a dozen people, it doesn't automatically instill a deep fear in most people of I'm going to be attacked and killed by a white man. And part of that is, the things that shape our biases are all these signals that we have in our brains from our own experiences, from stories, from the news, etc. So, for example, if I see that a white man has just killed a bunch of people, my brain also knows, oh, but I know a ton of really good, wonderful, decent white men. And so my brain takes that little nugget and it's like, oh, oh look at that. 
We'll store that away, but it doesn't become the main focus in my brain. It gets filed into a category of like, oh, so that guy, not so good. And even as a society, we tend to say, okay, well, oh, that one man must have had mental health issues, which is a whole other topic we won't get into at the moment, because that should be extended to people of all backgrounds. That being said, we, and here in Utah, I am led to believe it's much more diverse now than it has been historically, but we still have a fairly significant lack of diversity. Um, and even throughout the country, unless you're in really large metropolitan areas, in most parts of the country, uh, people still tend to, to categorize themselves and to affiliate themselves with people who are similar to themselves. So even in communities that have more diversity, there's not necessarily more diversity in people's daily interactions. Um, even if you look here in Ogden, you can see that as well. And so, if the only interaction that you're having with a person from another race is what you're seeing in the news, or on TV, or in movies, it can start to skew that view. Because as we know, in the wonderful world, for example, of news, there's the common saying, if it bleeds, it leads. So generally, the stories that we're seeing are the most horrific ones. There's rarely much media coverage of folks out grocery shopping, or helping their kids with homework, doing the laundry, day-to-day -day stuff that, that most of us do. So we start to get these skewed views. Um, there have been different pockets of this throughout history. It's one of those two steps forward, one step back kind of dances. But if we look now at some of the images that are portrayed that involve race, there's often a specifically stereotyped view that is shared in our brains and the majority of people, if you ask them, do you have racist tendencies? They're like, well, no. Of course not. I'm a good human, and I would never have these tendencies. The fact of the matter is that every person has implicit biases, whether that's race, religion, gender, socioeconomic status, geographic location, a wide variety of, of input that goes into our brain, where our brain takes these conscious thoughts, and they turn into these subconscious biases. Now, where that plays in in our life is that if you look back 51 and a half years ago, people were very explicit in stating that interracial relationships should not be a thing. That it was wrong for people to mix their races in a relationship. How dare they? This was not just the good folks of Virginia that apparently thought that. It was a fairly widespread uh, status or opinion that was held. So, now, fortunately, we don't face as much explicit bias. That is not to say we do not face any. We still get comments, which often surprise me, uh, where people will remark about us as an interracial couple, and not always favorably, even here in good old Ogden, Utah. So, um, much of that now isn't an explicit statement. It's implicit views. It's, for example, that when I tell people that I've met and that I'm working with, oh yeah, so my husband and son are busy doing whatever, and I show them a picture, and they're like, oh, that's not what I thought they would look like. <laughs> now, that implicit bias that we have that faces us, and that comes through in often well-intentioned and somewhat passive statements, is something that we as a couple get to look at together. So when we look at the issue of trust, which is this month's theme, and we look at how like implicit bias shapes our trust in, in society, how we trust others, how others trust us, um, part of it is with us as a couple, finding that good foundation of trust within that. And as I recommend for all couples, a good cornerstone of building trust within a relationship is communication. That often means a lot of really hard conversations. Then when we have people make statements, um, as explicit or implicit as those may come across, that that leads to conversations, often challenging conversations, that challenge us as a couple and also individually. Um, our son, the one who looks just like my husband without a beard right back there, um, <laughs> it gets to be part of hearing these conversations as well, so that he is raised aware that not all people view our family in the same way that we view our own love and our own family. 
And so in with that, the trust within a relationship comes through those cornerstones of communication, even when it's really hard. Now, my favorite part of this is how we build for ourselves and how I encourage all people to build trust in humanity. Now, if we talk about having that limited lens of what we see, those expressions from others, our engagement from other uh, races, religions, socioeconomic status, etc., that the way that you can best tear down some of that implicit bias is by filling your life with experiences that help outweigh, similar to why we know that not all white men are mass murderers, of being able to engage in much more diverse experiences, much more diverse groups, um, and really pushing ourselves beyond our comfort zones. The cool thing about comfort zones is that when you push them, they grow. It's magical. Now, our favorite way to do this happens to be, as Britta mentioned earlier, travel. I tell you, a few things make me happier than planning a trip, even if I'm not the one going on it. If I don't get tenure, I'll become a travel agent, and we'll be fine. <laughs> but in that, there's a few benefits to travel. First of all, I love to eat food internationally. But in with that, the way, for example, that we as individuals, as well as a couple, are perceived in different communities constantly changes. How we are seen as an interracial couple in a place where uh, a predominant amount of a population, such as the Dominican Republic, are interracial is seen very differently. When we've had opportunities to go to places like India, where uh, both of us were outliers on the racial spectrum of what most folks in southern India racially identify as, um, we were seen in a very different way. And that allows us to explore who we are individually and who we are as a couple in a way that causes um, a strength and a bond, but also we take our son with us. And I often hear people say, oh, it's gotta be dangerous taking a kid out of the country. Other countries are scary. But again, that's because in the news, we only hear about other countries if something has just gone horribly wrong. <laughs> Civil war, mass explosion, genocide of some sort. Um, and what we've gotten to learn as we've restored and continued to foster our faith in humanity is that for all the places we've gone, and there's some folks back there next to my husband, those are my parents, they're much more well-versed in travel than I am, which is a considerable amount of travel, and with my husband and son's considerable amount of travel, you start to see these universal themes come forward. That regardless of race, and regardless of religion, and socioeconomic status, and geographic location, and all those other factors, the majority of people wake up in the morning and try to do the best they know with what they have, and what they know. Most people are just trying to make life better for the next generation than they've had. They're trying to make sure that their bills are paid and that they engage with others, that they grow in love. Most people want a connection to humanity. They want a connection and understanding to each other. So the more that we engage in a respectful way and communicate and share our love and share ourselves with a broader and more diverse community, both here, nationally, and abroad, the more we build that trust in humanity, and the more that also builds humanity's trust in each of us. So I challenge each of you to, to find little pockets here and there to, and I know that this is definitely one of those like uh, preaching to the choir moments, because just the foundations of this exact structure and, and the themes that bring everyone together in this congregation tends to be a fairly open group looking to intermingle with people from all different backgrounds. But I do challenge each person to try to find, even if it's once a month, a way to really expand past your own comfort zone, to really engage with, with not only people, but entire communities that are different from our own experience. Because that's where that growth takes place, and that's where that trust really builds. Thank you. We are a religion which like sunshine grows everywhere. Its faithful all things, it shines a good.